antennes.
Uh, thank you very much. You can be seated. I will welcome uh, our Reverend, Reverend Rachel to uh, give us a word of God. So welcome, Reverend. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great joy to see every one of us here and welcome to day part two, our uh, guest today. Uh, before we pray and, and start um, our program, I'd like to share some key words. Um, let's see what God's word says in light of our being here today. Um, I was thinking about this public lecture and not long ago we were here for another public lecture, uh, specifically by the school of law um, and, and talking different things. But every time I... I get this opportunity. Uh, it gets me thinking about God and law, you know, uh, what what God says about um, the law and, and where is God in all of this? And even for us as a Christian university, providing um, uh, your education as, as, as uh, in the field of law. And I was thinking that, that the truth of God's word is that the purpose um, of law as God intended it was to provide order in society. Um, and we see that from the very beginning of the story of the Israelites in the Bible, even from the beginning in creation, how God um, created the whole world and just the order that he had for every day. But so the Israelites uh, come about and, and um, he's freeing them from captivity and starting to walk a journey with them and he gives them, he begins by giving them the Ten Commandments. Story we know very well, yes, yes. Um, he gave the Israelites the Ten Commandments so that they would be clearly guided on how to relate with him, but also how to relate uh, one with another as a community. And, and we can get to read the flow of that in, in Exodus uh, 20. But as we move further into God's story uh, with the Israelites, he gives them so many more uh, laws uh, to govern their relationship with one another, how to interact with one another, even as they continued with their journey to the promised land. And really what God was doing was to get them ingrained into that law so that even when they get into the promised land, uh, they would know how to live with one another. They would know how to handle different life issues that would come their way. And of course today, um, the, the, the same thing happens. Uh, world governments have centered their laws around the same things uh, that God addressed with the Israelites. Um, what was God's point with all of that? Order. Really, just order. Um, he knew that people would, would have different perspectives of life, and, and we see that every day in our world. Um, and, and because of that, we would see life matters differently. But even with law provided um, to the Israelites and even to us today uh, for the sake of order, we live in a world that people easily decide what they want to do. <laughs> people decide to harm one another, be unkind to each other, uh, treat each other badly, basically doing what uh, they want to do. And so God's call for us today, and especially for many of you that are seated here as law scholars, um, law students, uh, God's call for us today is the need to ensure that justice is upheld at all costs, in all circumstances. It's the reason you're studying law. <laughs> it's pr primarily, I'm sure there are many other reasons, and maybe our speaker today will allude to that, or the people that will speak. But it's primarily because there are people who are not doing what they are supposed to do, <laughs> you know, what the law requires. And I thought of three things that I would share with us that we'd keep in mind even as we progress on with our public lecture today. One is that God calls us to uphold justice. God is calling you to uphold justice in your generation at all costs. Um, Psalm 82 verse 2 to 4 says, How long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked. And then verse 3 says, 
you should instead defend the weak and the fatherless, uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed, rescue the weak and the needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked. It is how you handle law and your field that determine whether the weak, the fatherless, the oppressed, the poor will find space in society today, will find justice in society today. To uphold, God calls you to uphold justice at all costs. Number two, as you uphold justice, remember to pursue righteousness. Interesting that the Bible says in some verse, uh, chapter 89, verse 14, that righteousness and justice are the foundations of God's throne. Can you imagine that? How much of scripture does he talk about love? God even tells us, you know, Jesus said the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart and then love your neighbor, right? But the Bible doesn't say that the foundation of God's throne is love. It's important, but it says righteousness and justice, they go together at the foundations of his throne. And so hence, the challenge to you is, is what Amos 5, um, verse 7, and then I'll read verse 24 says. It says, there are those who turn justice into bitterness and cast righteousness to the ground. In other words, ignore it completely. No, 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 don't do that. Verse 24 says, let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. They have to go together. You have to pursue what is right. You have to want to do what is right. Thank God for scripture. It teaches us what right is and how to do it. So one, uphold justice. Two, pursue righteousness. And lastly, number three, know that whatever you do, God will judge you. Whatever you do, God will judge you. Ecclesiastes 3 talks about there's a time and a season for everything. But it's interesting that verse 16 and 17 says, this writer says, and I saw something else under the sun. In the place of judgment, wickedness was there. And in the place of justice, wickedness was there. I say to myself, God will bring into judgment both the righteous and the wicked. For there will be a time for every activity, a time to judge every deed. My challenge to you, even as you come to this public lecture and listen to wisdom, I pray that this is what this public lecture will provide you. Wisdom that, that will help you know how to uphold justice, how to walk in righteousness, and how to remember that God will judge you. That as you sit here, the intention of your heart for everything that you will do in your field will be to honor God. That when all is said and done, your desire will be to honor God. So listen keenly, pay attention, um, you know, take note, grasp knowledge that you can in these opportunities that are provided. But make a deliberate decision in your heart that your intention, whatever opportunity God gives you at whatever point in this life, in whatever part of this world, your desire and your intention is to uphold justice, is to walk in righteousness, because you will always remember that God will judge you. I pray that when you finally stand before God, having served in your field of law, that you will hear the most precious words, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for yet another opportunity to gain wisdom, to learn, to glean from those who have taken steps before us and get, gain knowledge, gain understanding, gain wisdom, gain insight, O oh God. And I pray that this will be a great opportunity that will transform our lives. God, I pray for every, especially every young person, every student that is seated here, 
but also every one of us that has an opportunity to uphold just, uh, right, uh, justice and, and live in righteousness, pursue righteousness, oh God. Lord, that you will help us to remember that these are the foundations of your throne. So guide our discussions this afternoon, that you will be honored by them and that they will guide the intentions of our hearts to desire to do the right thing for your glory. So I pray that you bless everything that will happen in this uh, hall this afternoon, O oh God, that you will be exalted and lifted, that your truths will reign throughout our time here for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Let us appreciate her again. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Reverend Rachel, for sharing with us the word of God. Daystar University is founded on Christian values. We are a Christian university that blends in, uh, that integrates between the learning and the faith. So we integrate the two at the same time. So we are blessed uh, to have the chaplaincy uh, bringing us the word of God. And as you've heard, our God is a just God. And also, uh, his throne uh, is um, um, a, a throne which uh, looks at, just, uh, looks at uh, our faults justly. So you cannot accuse that God uh, punished you or uh, did anything without uh, you looking back and saying, oh no, he's a just God because he assessed I deserve this kind of uh, punishment. So looking at our time, it has, uh, uh, we're already behind time. So I will move a little bit quicker in this. So first of all, I will um, uh, speak of two things about law school. And uh, our, guest, uh, our guest speaker, welcome to our law school. Uh, this day's the, uh, law school is growing. And we, right now, we're already starting to feel that impact. We might get to the opportunity to even go international to experience uh, some of um, these um, international uh, legal standards to partner with other universities and to uh, get to know what lies at international level, like uh, where you descend from. So our um, law school has, uh, uh, several, um, has several activities that are running at the moment. Uh, we have a public lecture which is coming up, uh, or rather not a public lecture, but a legal aid week, which is uh, scheduled to come uh, in the month of, uh, this, this month around uh, from 11th to 16th of this March. Today is first March. So sometimes on first, sometimes it's uh, a little bit difficult. You may go back to the previous month. So this month we have um, a legal aid week that is uh, aim, aiming at uh, enriching our young advocates with several skills, especially the skills uh, that are practical in nature. So and on the first day, which is uh, on, 11th, on 11th and 12th and 13th, those uh, three days, we'll be having camps uh, where we will pitch tent here and uh, our main campus and also at Mavoko Locots. And then on uh, the following day, that is on uh, uh, 14th of uh, uh, this March, we'll be having a panel discussion and that will be held here, where we bring in the young lawyers to share their experiences and enrich our own uh, students. We also have on the same, in the, on the, in the same week, we also have um, a legal dinner that is also scheduled to take place on uh, 15th, that is on Friday in the evening. And this is an opportunity for us now to have uh, some expert lawyers from uh, our Kenyan fraternity to share the experiences, to share uh, their journey with our young lawyers in that opportunity. And then finally, we have a mentorship outreach 
that Daystone University Law School is planning for mentorship outreach uh, to the high schools. So we have selected two high schools to visit this time round to enrich them with uh, um, our experiences, also from our side. What it, what, it, what it takes to be a lawyer, what it takes to enroll for law degree and uh, related things. So we have all those um, uh, things and of course, in addition to that, we are also privileged, uh, perhaps the dean may speak to it, uh, we are also privileged to uh, have been selected to host a moot court competition funded by a non-governmental organization called Unwanted Witness, uh, so that we'll be hosting it here at Daystar University. So with that, I will uh, welcome our Dean of Students uh, to share with us his opening remarks and also uh, do some introductions in his capacity. So uh, welcome. Welcome, uh, Dr. Dr. Morris Ajuang Owar, and share with us your wisdom. Thank you very much. So our program is self uh, rolling. Uh, the the dean will then invite our uh, Ebo DVC to address us. Thank you very much. Uh, th uh, thank you very much, Ayub. Uh, DVC academics, research, and student affairs, Professor Faith Nguru, our chief uh, guest, Professor John Inazu, uh, his colleague, Jeff, uh, also from the United States, uh, but uh, at, um, currently uh, with his wife here in Tenwek, in uh, uh, the Rift Valley, and uh, an important guest as well, Sam, who is also accompanying his father. And I think that uh, is, um, uh, you know, uh, a good example and possibly a challenge to fathers that you're able to uh, take your child along and uh, to, um, uh, you know, uh, ensure that they also appreciate the things that you do. That is mentoring at an early age. Uh, thank you very much. I also wish to recognize the law lecturers who are present here. Uh, we have uh, uh, Mr. Justice Mutia, who is our coordinator of judicial uh, attachment, basically practical, judicial attachment, legal practicum, and international internship. Uh, Justice Mutia, you can wave. <laughs> His area of specialization is the, is the law of evidence. So the students here uh, uh, benefit from his knowledge in the area of, uh, uh, of evidence as a practitioner. And we have Mr. Emmanuel Ekiru, uh, the youngest kid in the School of Law. <laughs> okay. And uh, Emmanuel's area of interest is uh, constitutional law. And I think that uh, will be very closely re related to our topic uh, for the day. Um, our dear students, uh, good afternoon and shalom. Uh, mine first is to um, express our gratitude and, um, uh, you know, uh, satisfaction to have the law school host uh, this second public lecture. We had uh, a lecture uh, last month. Uh, and it also had a very high-profiled guest speaker. That was our former Attorney General of the Republic of Kenya. So therefore, we continue with high-profiled, uh, um, uh, you know, public lectures. And uh, this particular public lecture is important in many ways. I did emphasize in our last uh, session here that public lectures avail you students a unique opportunity, a unique opportunity to get knowledge from those experts and to share their experiences. It is a leap in terms of learning. Ordinarily, you have lectures in class, but uh, those are structured lectures. But here, in a public lecture, you have an opportunity to interact at close range 
with an expert in an area. And our public lecturer today could not um, have been um, uh, you know, uh, better suited for this particular topic. If you look at the CV of uh, our public lecturer, Professor John Inazu, Professor John Inazu is a professor of law and religion. He has a PhD in uh, law. He has another PhD in um, a political science. So therefore, in our context here, we could be referring to him as a professor, doctor, doctor. Okay, we are familiar. We have a member of staff who also has uh, PhDs in two different areas. And uh, therefore, again, I think that is an inspiration to you young uh, people, that uh, education is uh, endless, that after law, you can do something else. After the first degree, you can have a second degree and you can have a PhD, and you can then uh, you know, move to another area and begin afresh. So therefore, I think uh, uh, the choice of our guest lecturer is uh, ideal, and uh, you cannot find a person who has more knowledge in this area than himself. The topic is significant, and I will not want to preempt the um, lecture of uh, a professor, but indeed it is true that in life there is no political change which has happened without riding on the back of freedom of uh, assembly. The major political changes, the revolutions, have all ridden on the back of the right to assemble. As we are here, we are enjoying the right to assembly, even as we are here. Kenya is independent thanks to uh, our forefathers exercising the right to assembly to uh, advocate for uh, independence. Without the right to assembly, we would not have independence. Without the right to assembly, the United States, uh, the African Americans would not have the right to vote. So the right to assembly is a critical fundamental right and freedom. All rights appear to anchor themselves on this right, particularly their protection, that you can only protect them by assembling, then expressing yourselves. So therefore, I would uh, uh, want to agree that this particular right is significant. And particularly for our law students, those who are studying uh, uh, constitutional law. If you're studying constitutional law, you cannot um, uh, you know, complete that course without appreciating the right to assembly and that it is a fundamental right and freedom. Those who are studying international law, and uh, I think uh, do, uh, we, 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 there are those who are in my class for international law. Those who study uh, public international law appreciate the um, uh, utility of uh, the Bill of Rights in uh, the various, um, uh, you know, in the area of human rights and um, humanitarian law, particularly human rights, the Bill of Rights. So therefore, this topic, uh, is an important topic, and I believe that uh, you will benefit greatly from this public lecture. You will benefit greatly from this public lecture. Without much ado, uh, I would wish to invite our Deputy Vice Chancellor, academics, students, and uh, 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 students and uh, 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 academics, research and students affairs, Professor Faith Nguru, to make her remarks and then in turn to invite our guest uh, speaker, Professor Faith Nguru. Good afternoon, everyone. I ask that I be given these three books so that they will encourage me as I stand before you to introduce our speaker uh, this afternoon. Uh, because I love books, I love scholarship, and the smell of paper is always very encouraging to, 
to keep pushing on and to understand that there's no end to learning, there's no end to knowledge, and to really appreciate those who take time to write. I like our speaker this afternoon. I stand here on behalf of the Vice Chancellor, Professor Laban Peter Hiro, who was invited to come and make a statement, but he is not able to attend uh, this function. And I also speak on my own behalf uh, as the DVC in charge of academics. Very appreciative of the School of Law. Our youngest school, and yet already producing reports in the academic world here. We had our first graduating class, and I'm informed that they have done very well at the Kenya School of Law. Let's give them a hand clap. I am waiting for the dean, and this is the dean of the School of Law, not the dean of students, because you asked for the dean of students and I was looking for him, and I couldn't find him. <laughs> but uh, Dr. Owar will give us, all of us in Senate and in management, a report of how your colleagues are doing um, or did at the School of Law because this will encourage us and encourage you. So we are gathered today for this very important public lecture on the global significance of the right of assembly. And already the Dean has mentioned how important this is, that we can walk around freely and then assemble and talk about issues that affect us. What a right, what a privilege, and we cannot take it for granted. Not everyone in the world is in the position where we find ourselves in. And uh, the lecture is significant at Daystar because it will help us come here with our diverse perspectives so that we can have a dialogue, we can have better understanding about these matters. And hopefully, and especially in such a small gathering, today we are not a huge crowd, we can engage a little more deeply in this discussion to understand better what it is that we have in our hearts, especially for social change. What is keeping us away from achieving the ideals of peace, for example, and development, and how can we engage for justice? Thank you, Pastor Rachel, uh, for talking about justice and righteousness, and even judgment. The lecture, I believe, will provide us an opportunity for intellectual en enrichment within our community and beyond, and it will give us some insights, we hope, that will continue to foster a culture of learning and critical thinking, uh, which is so critical. Giving us more knowledge about these principles uh, that we talk about, principles that undergird democracy and societal progress. We are going to hear, and I, and I'm think, I think you are very ready for this, to reinforce such values, as I have mentioned. And these are central, in a way, to the ethos of Desta University, where I think you all know what our mission is, what our vision is, to provide learners with higher education that equips them to grow spiritually, intellectually, enabling them to serve as transformational agents in their professions and in this case, your chosen profession of law, and give Christ-centered servant leadership in the home, church, and society. And those are our areas of influence, and even in scholarship globally. I believe that this uh, public lecture will serve as a catalyst for our own reflection, for the dialogue I've talked about, and for action. It's not just learning for the sake of learning,
but hopefully there will be some action that will contribute to the university's broader mission of academic excellence and societal impact, ready to support the courses we believe in. And we all believe in some courses. There are some that are common, there are some that are common to us, there are some that are individual or community-based. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me just ask those from the School of Law to raise your hands so that you clap for others who are not from the School of Law. A majority. So just give a hand clap to the minority. <laughs> who are here, who also want to learn and to understand. Our speaker uh, this afternoon is somebody who has come to us through networks that uh, the Vice Chancellor made. We had um, in the past months a visit from the President of Taylor University and in their discussion uh, our Vice Chancellor and uh, President, equivalent Vice Chancellor of Taylor, they talked about different things. And among them was a visit. And our guest speaker today is that visitor that they talked about. Uh, somebody who would come and share with us from his experience and knowledge the different areas and I carried these books, and they're beautifully done. The covers are beautiful um, and common ground, living faithfully in a world of difference. And we understand the differences, but how can we live faithfully in it? Learning to disagree. Some of us, because of our culture, are not able to disagree agreeably. And probably this is what this book is about. I haven't read it, but I imagine that uh, it has something to do with the surprising path to navigating differences with empathy and respect. Key concepts for us to learn and to appreciate. And finally, another book uh, from Professor John Inazu, Confident Pluralism. Surviving, and not only surviving, and thriving through deep differences. And at a university like ours, there are differences, there can be differences, but how do we work together? How do we assemble? How do we engage this freedom to assemble, to iron out our differences, and from them become stronger? So it is my pleasure on my own behalf and on behalf of our Vice Chancellor to welcome you, sir, uh, to give your lecture. And I believe everybody will be very ready to engage with you. Karibu sana, meaning welcome. Good afternoon. Welcome, faculty, students, administrators, Deputy Vice Chancellor Faith and Dean Maurice. Thank you for the tremendous welcome here at Daystar University. I'm here with my 11-year-old son, Sam, and we have just spent a, a week with our friends, the Donathorns, who are volunteering this year at Tenwick Hospital. Jeff Donathorn has been my friend for 35 years, so this is a fun trip for us. And I also bring you greetings from the Dean of my law school, Russell Osgood. I'm here to speak today about the global significance of the right of assembly, and I'll pay particular attention to assembly in the United States and in Kenya. This talk for me is part of a long intellectual journey that began almost 20 years ago when I was working for a federal judge 
And I was looking at the text of the U.S. First Amendment, written in 1791. I noticed the clause, the right of the people peaceably to assemble. And it occurred to me that in three years of law school and four years of legal practice, I had barely heard of the right of assembly, let alone thought about its scope and meaning. A little research confirmed that no U.S. scholar had written about the right of the assembly since the 1960s, and the U.S. Supreme Court had not addressed the right of assembly since the early 1980s. This initial curiosity led to my 2012 book, Liberty's Refuge, The Forgotten Freedom of Assembly. And I should say, thanks to a Creative Commons license, this book is available online for free. You can go to my website, which is on the handout, and, and download the entire PDF of the book for free. Even though the United States was not paying attention to the right of assembly, the international community and countries like Kenya were busy codifying their own versions of assembly. This has not meant that the right of assembly has been fully respected in all of these places. And indeed, even during the short history of Kenya's assembly rights since 2010, Kenyan courts have interpreted it narrowly and sometimes incorrectly. In my time with you today, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the right of assembly in US and in Kenyan law. And then I will turn to some specific examples of assemblies and their restrictions in both countries in order to understand how the law shapes how people actually experience their right to assemble. So let me begin with the United States. The right of assembly in our country is grounded in the First Amendment to the US Constitution, the amendment that contains the most significant civil liberties protections in the United States. The First Amendment includes five distinct rights. Does anybody know them? Can anyone name the rights of the First Amendment? Law students? Guesses? How about one of them? Did I hear? Privacy is close, but not, not in the text. Yes. Yes, speech is one. That's great. Uh, they're actually interesting. I'll get to that. There is no right of association in the First Amendment. So there's speech. Yes. Yes. Speech, religion, petition, press, and assembly. And interestingly, assembly is the only one of those five rights that requires more than one person. I can do all of those other rights by myself. I can speak by myself. I could publish a blog and be the press. I can petition the government on my own. In some faiths, although not Christianity, in some faiths, I can practice religion by myself, but I cannot assemble by myself. It needs at least one other person to be exercised. So the right of assembly points to the relational dimensions of our lives, of our civic lives. We work, live, worship, and learn, not as individual people, but in groups of people. And it's in those groups that we shape our deepest values and our identities. As I lay out in greater detail in Liberty's Refuge, this broader right of assembly in law and culture was present throughout US history. It was particularly embodied in the experiences of citizens who lived, worked, and protested outside of and often against majority norms. Assembly is also the only First Amendment right that is qualified with an with a adverb. Assembly must be peaceable. The contours of what qualifies as peaceable have been much debated. In Kenya, the right of assembly is also guaranteed in your country's constitution. Similar to the US constitutional provision, in Kenya, one can only assemble peaceably. The Kenya Constitution adds one other qualification. Does anybody know what it is? Assembly is limited by what? In Kenya's Constitution. You must be unarmed. You cannot have weapons when you assemble. And I should mention here, this is a textual distinction 
that reflects a significant practical difference between Kenya and the United States. In the US, the Second Amendment to our Constitution guarantees the right to bear arms, the right to have weapons. And when the First and Second Amendments combine, when armed citizens protest and counter-protest, the situation can become incredibly volatile. There is one puzzle about the right of assembly in both countries. This is what Professor Emanuel alluded to a minute ago. What is the relationship between the group that assembles, that protests, the public gathering? It could also be not just a physical gathering, but maybe an online space. What's that physical gathering and the group that forms prior to the public expression? Not all assembling depends upon a prior group. Some protests or some marches happen spontaneously, but most assembling, think about the groups that you're part of, the issues that you care about. Most assembling depends upon the planning, purpose, and relationships that emerge from relationships over time. We might most naturally think of this as the right of association. But the United States Constitution, as I mentioned a minute ago, does not have a separate right of association. Instead, the Supreme Court first recognized it in 1958. Our Bill of Rights was established in 1791. The right of association is first recognized almost 150 years later. But the protections for groups, not just the gathering, but the groups that precede the gathering, those existed long before the formal recognition of the right of association, arguably encompassed in the right of assembly. In contrast to the US, the Kenyan constitution separately includes a broad right to freedom of association that is distinct from the right of assembly. The Kenyan constitution guarantees the freedom to form, join, or participate in the activities of an association of any kind. This division, the separation between assembly and association, has allowed courts to more easily consider right of assembly challenges separate from right of association challenges. And this is also true in international law. Article 20 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states that everyone has the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and association. And the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, like Kenya, splits assembly and association into two separate articles. Article 21 guarantees the right of peaceful assembly, and Article 22 states everyone shall have the right to freedom of association with others. In both the Universal Declaration and the International Covenant, assembly comes before association. There is no international official pronouncement that defines what an assembly is, but here's what one scholar writing in the international context suggests. An assembly is an intentional gathering by two or more people, including privately and in online spaces. As in the United States, international law links assembly not only to association, but also to expression. The gathering is important for the expression that comes from it. And in fact, international law recognizes the full protection of peaceful assembly. This is similar to what Dean Maurice said. The full protection of peaceful assembly is possible only when other often overlapping rights are also protected. Freedom of expression, freedom of association, and political participation. These are the freedoms that together protect private institutions like Daystar to exist free from government interference. I'd like to turn now briefly to a, a short discussion of how these rights work out in the United States. As I mentioned earlier, the neglect of assembly in the US is partly attributable to this new right of association. In 1958, the US Supreme Court recognized that right of association for the first time in words it found implicit in the text of the Constitution. Not actually written there, but the Supreme Court said it was somewhere in the mix. Its constitutional meaning has never been fully developed. 
part of the ambiguity owes to the timing of the emergence of this right in 1958. In the United States, in the late 1950s and the early 1960s, the Supreme Court addressed dozens of cases about this new right of association. Those cases were brought by only two groups. The first was the NAACP, an important civil rights group advocating for the freedom of black Americans. The second was the Communist Party of the United States. The court telegraphed its sympathies in the results-oriented nature of its opinions. The NAACP won almost every case, and the Communist Party lost all of them. These results supported preferred political outcomes in the country, but they failed to develop any doctrinal framework around the right of association. And this lack of clarity is not just limited to association. In 2018, a US federal court in Minnesota concluded there is no freestanding right to free assembly, which is pretty amazing since it's actually in the text of the Constitution. And in 2020, a federal court in Kentucky addressing an assembly cl claim related to COVID restrictions, and there were some of those in Kenya as well, this court incorrectly concluded that courts typically evaluate speech, assembly, and petition under one combined analysis, also not true in light of the text of the Constitution. There have, in fact, been 39 recent US federal cases involving the right of assembly, and none of them have actually resolved the case around the right of assembly. Every single decision has turned to some other right ignoring the assembly claim. And part of what's at the heart of these decisions is known in the United States as the public forum doctrine. The public forum doctrine focuses on time, place, and manner restrictions and presumes a regulation is legitimate, a government regulation of assembly or speech is legitimate as long as it satisfies what the Supreme Court has called content neutrality. In theory, content neutrality is supposed to protect against government targeting speech or expression because of the ideas that it conveys. In practice, content neutrality often misses the connection and the importance of the speech and the time, place, and manner in which it occurs. So let me give you some examples here. If you have a content neutral time restriction, in other words, you're saying we don't really care about what the speaker is saying, we don't care what they're advocating, we're just saying we're going to limit the time in which you can advocate, you can still affect and curtail the expression. If you closed public sidewalks outside of legislative buildings on the days of important votes, or if you closed protests on sidewalks outside of courthouses on the days that decisions are announced, you could just say, this is just a time restriction, but if it's timed to the actual protest, you could, you could deeply harm the protest. Similar with place restrictions. So you could say, we don't really care about what the person is protesting. We don't care about the content of their protest, but we're just going to limit them from proximity. We're going to limit people protesting against wage and labor conditions away from businesses or politicians. And that can also diminish the significance or the effect of the protest. In the United States, we have these often around political conventions where the local authorities will say, you can protest against the political officials you just have to be several miles away in an area where there is no press and where there are no people. And you can see how that would harm the nature of the protest. And then finally, think about content neutral manner restrictions. When the government says, you can protest whatever you want, but you have to do it in a certain form. For example, the government allows you to protest, but it requires all of your signs to be professionally made. What happens if you can't afford to make a professional sign or how about a protest that says you can protest whatever you want, but you can't wear bright colors? And what if your cause was known for wear the wearing, your, your tribe or your politics was known for the wearing of bright colors? And the government said, this is just a neutral restriction. It's going to affect you personally, though. These restrictions of protests in public spaces through time, place, and manner are too easily justified apart from expressive content. In many cases, the government can say, here is a curfew, or here's a protest zone, or here's a buffer, and it can come up with some reason to regulate the activity 
that is purportedly content neutral. It could say the activity is too noisy or too disruptive or too distracting. But the right of assembly should require more of this. It should require more than this content neutral inquiry that ignores fundamental values like the power of collective expression and the importance of group solidarity. In contrast to the United States, Kenya guarantees the rights to assemble and association in two separate constitutional provisions. Both are subject to restrictions under section 24 of the Kenyan constitution, which provides that a right or fundamental freedom in the Bill of Rights shall not be limited except by law, and then only to the extent the limitation is reasonable and justifiable in an open and democratic society based on human dignity, equality, and freedom. While this provision may be consistent across both rights, its broad and ambiguous scope sometimes allows for significant restrictions by the government. Kenyan assembly law also imposes limitations that are similar to those time, place, and manner restrictions in the United States. For example, in the 2017 Boniface Mwangi case, a group of political dissidents wanted to hold a rally outside the gates to State House. Their principal goal was to protest the alleged corruption of the president and his party. The Kenyan police denied their request to protest there, and the court upheld the rejection, noting the protesters could instead assemble outside the president's official office. Kenya's association clause has also faced restrictions in practice. The Kenyan constitution guarantees the right to an association of any kind. This textual guarantee creates a problem because it is too absolute to be enforceable. Surely, for example, Kenya would not tolerate associations that permit human sacrifice. Indeed, just last August, the government here banned five churches associated with cult leader Paul McKenzie, currently on trial for the deaths of 400 of his congregants, including many children. These, the, his message was salvation comes from starvation. And the, the Kenyan government properly said, you cannot have associations that advocate for that. On the other hand though, the protections of the Kenyan constitution have provided many assurances of assembly and association in this country. While in the US, the right of association remains quite vague, Kenya's association has fared better. A 2013 decision from the High Court, e.g. against Non-Governmental Organizations Coordination Board, protected the formation of an LGBTQ advocacy organization. The court wrote, freedom of association is universally accepted as fundamental to a democratic society. The principles of pluralism and democracy necessitate that all citizens be free to assemble and express their opinions and be limited in their ability to do so only by very narrow and specific circumstances. Here's the point. It doesn't matter if you don't like the other group or what they're advocating for. They have the right to be there just as you want the right to be who you are with the people who you want to be with. One of the challenges, of course, in both Kenya and the United States is the government has a legitimate function in maintaining public peace and social order. And when people form into groups, secretly or publicly, they often pose increased threats to peace and order. We can see this most clearly in both countries in attempts to regulate unlawful assemblies. Think of an unlawful assembly as something like a combination of a criminal conspiracy and a peace disturbance among a group of people. This is one of the key provisions relied on by police in both countries to disperse protests. And it is misunderstood often in theory and in practice. Unlawful assembly is connected to the completed offense of riot. Anyone here taking criminal law yet? What's the difference between an attempt crime and a completed crime? Anyone? Want to be brave and suggest the answer? Yes.
That's exactly right. And the key there is when you have an attempted crime, all you're trying to do is evaluate what's in the head of the perpetrator, but you do not have the completed action yet to assess what has happened. So attempt crimes are very hard to regulate and they come closest to these concerns of civil liberties violations. They're very hard to prove. Like attempt law in general, when it comes to unlawful assembly, we don't actually know when a gathered group is moving from a peaceable assembly to a riot. Unlawful assembly is the law's best effort to create a buffer between what is allowable and constitutional and what is dangerous and harmful. But we still have to wait for some indication that something bad is about to happen. We need to give some breathing space for the right to be exercised. This is easier said than done. I live in the United, in the United States in the state of Missouri, and there are only two appellate court decisions interpreting the state's unlawful assembly provision. One of them involved college students, about your age, who had set out to commit some pranks one evening. They were throwing bottle rockets into the grass and things like this. The court held that the unlawful assembly requirement of an agreement between seven or more people in the case of Missouri did not require an actual agreement. So think again to attempt law. If you, don't, if you don't have to prove an actual agreement, you're just guessing. That group of people looks like they're up to something bad. That group of people looks like someone will want to regulate. In fact, you could be seemingly culpable for an unlawful assembly based on mere presence alone, or what the court in that case called a duty to disassociate. If you are with your friends in a public setting and there is a protest, in this example, the court would impose on you a duty to disassociate, to leave the gathering, or you could personally be liable. This has real world consequences. So consider, for example, a political protest that comes after several earlier demonstrations. If one of those earlier demonstrations had turned violent, then our protesters constructively on notice that their gathering might also turn violent, that their mere presence at that gathering could be sufficient for a criminal conviction. Suppose one person in a protest of 100 demonstrators throws a rock at police. Are the other 99 now under a duty to disassociate? Imputing the actions of anyone in a protest area also incentivizes what we call in US law a heckler's veto. What if there are protesters, 100 peaceful protesters, and one counter protester who doesn't like the protest? If that counter protester turns violent, does that, does that corrupt the entire protest? Or are the other peaceful protesters still allowed to engage in peaceful expression? Under Missouri's law, a single person, either opposed to the goals of the protesters or convinced that violent means are necessary, could shut down a protest with a single act and render everyone in the area criminally liable. Kenya confronts similar challenges in Section 78 of the Penal Code, including a great deal of textual imprecision in the relationship between unlawful assembly and riot. And I don't have Section 78 on your handout, but during the Q&A, we could discuss it if you'd like. There are three sub-provisions within S Section 78, and they're quite unclear about the difference between a peaceful assembly an unlawful assembly and a riot. Note that even if these frameworks fail to support criminal convictions, government officials can still use them to, con to curtail the political significance of a protest. In other words, it's not just criminal liability that we're concerned about. These restrictions also deny other constitutional rights like speech, expression, and religious freedom. In Kenya, other restrictions on, uh, on assembly derive from the Public Order Act, which came before your 2010 constitution. The Public Order Act requires any person intending to convene a public meeting or public procession shall notify the regulating officer at least three days, but not more than 14 days before the proposed date of the public meeting. If proper notice is not given, then that assembly may be deemed unlawful. Now notice that, I wanna just read that first part again. Any person intending to convene a public meeting or a public procession. 
Think about how in practice, how comprehensive that is, particularly the failure to specify any minimum threshold of the size of the assembly. I think technically, if my son Sam and I met on the streets of Nairobi to pray together in public without providing the regulating officer with timely notice, we might be in violation of the Public Order Act. This requirement, which Kenyan courts have allowed to stand under Section 24, could give the government broad discretion to regulate assemblies. The act has no requirement that the government notify the applicant of receipt of their official request. And in fact, international monitoring organizations report numerous examples of Kenyan officials destroying notice documents, destroying evidence of the assembly's lawfulness and allowing for police to arrest or disperse protesters. Second, this notice requirement inhibits the organization of spontaneous protests. The act functionally prohibits any protest of a government action within three days of it being announced. Much like the spatial restrictions that I mentioned earlier, this strict temporal restriction can limit both the efficacy and the urgency of a message being conveyed by a protest. The implications of the Public Order Act are seen in a 2016 case involving Ferdinand Waititu. Did I get that right? Close? Okay. The case involved election protesters asserting their right to assemble. While the court ultimately allowed the protesters to assemble in some form, the judge wrote, the time chosen for the picketing assembly or demonstration ought to be reasonable. There is no doubt that the statute may occasionally draw picket lines and designate no-go zones for demonstrators and picketers. Requiring that a time might be reasonable or designating a protest spot as a no-go assembly zone illustrates the ways in which government can limit the expressive power of an assembly by constraining its form. Here's how the, Ke the Kenyan Penal Code defines an unlawful assembly. Where three or more persons being assembled with the intent to carry out some purpose conduct themselves in such a manner as to cause persons in the neighborhood reasonably to fear that the persons so assembled will commit a breach of the peace or will by such assembly needlessly and without reasonable occasion provoke other persons to commit a breach of the peace. Now it's also on the handout that I passed out. Any, any comments or observations about words in that provision that might be vague or might be concerning for government to enforce? What words did you hear? How about reasonable? Do you, study, do you study the reasonableness standard in some of your classes? What's reasonable and by whose account is what reasonable? This, the provision also says, cause persons in the neighborhood to fear. Whose neighborhood? Right? Might it be different in different parts of Nairobi or different parts of Kenya? And the statute said, if a reasonable person in your neighborhood is fearful, then the assembly is unlawful. So what kind of power or interpretation does that give to the local social group rather than some other more objective standard of the law. Many of these phrases draw from British common law antecedents and they raise ambiguities present to those or similar to those present in US assembly law. In 2017, I wrote an article titled Unlawful Assembly as Social Control and pointed out that phrases like persons in the neighborhood, reasonable fear, and even breach of peace can be highly subjective standards that default too heavily to what local police decide. One of the few decisions exploring breach of peace in Kenyan courts is a 2017 case, Hussein Khalid against Attorney General. Protesters outside of parliament had received permission from the government to engage in public assembly. The assembly began in an orderly fashion, but protesters eventually released pigs and animal blood as symbols to them of the government's greed. The government arrested the protesters for unlawful assembly, 
On appeal, the government argued the breach of peace included offensive conduct, another one of those words that's subject to interpretation. Without directly ruling on that decision, the high court permitted the prosecution as consistent with the Section 24 limitations. In other words, the government can shut down your assembly if it deems that you have engaged in offensive conduct. There's one other comparative dimension that I want to highlight in both US and Kenyan assembly law. The question is whether and to what degree protest organizers might risk civil liability for downstream harms. What happens when a protest organizer intends for an assembly to be peaceful, but participants of the assembly, or perhaps even just one participant, choose to engage in violence? This potential chilling effect could prevent movement leaders from ever organizing public protests. In the United States, a federal appellate court recently held in the case Doe against McKesson that a civil lawsuit by an injured police officer could proceed against a protest organizer. The organizer had never advocated for or engaged in any violent actions himself. The injuries to the officer were by, were by another person, but the court determined the protest organizer could still be liable. The court suggested liability for anything foreseeably violent. As I wrote in a recent brief to the US Supreme Court, the articulation of this so-called negligent protest standard is drastically overbroad. It threatens to impose nearly unlimited tort liability on any protest leader as soon as the protest crosses a highly subjective line and in fact, these dangers highlight to justify potential liability for, any, for nearly any public gathering. So think, for example, if you owned a sports arena and one person engaged in violent or destructive action, would you as the owner of the sports arena be liable, perhaps under this new emerging standard? This, this similar standard has also been seen in Kenya. The Public Order Act holds organizers criminally responsible for unlawful assemblies, even if the organizers were themselves not present. In 2019, the Kenyan High Court faced the question of civil liability when assemblies term riotous. The court ordered government officials to create a code of conduct to provide a clear line of responsibility of who is liable for loss of life or property, for injury, or when a member of the public is aggrieved due to a demonstration. Following this 2019 ruling, a member of the Kenyan parliament drafted and proposed an amendment to the Public Order Act. Although this bill was not ultimately adopted, it would have allowed courts to order protest organizers to compensate affected persons on such terms as the court may deem proper, even when the injury or property damages were not caused by the protest organizer. As in the US context, this broad civil liability could well have a chilling effect on those who organize protesters. Most of what I've said today has unfolded at the level of theory and legal doctrine. But I wanna close now before our question and answer time with a more personal reflection by calling your attention to the dedication that I wrote in my 2012 book the dedication was to my grandfathers, Ty and Bird. As I wrote in that book, in 1945, as the United States issued one of its most important opinions about the freedom of assembly, Bird Curtis set captive in a Nazi prisoner of war camp, and Ty Zoanazu stood behind barbed wire at Tule Lake relocation camp. My grandpa Bird was a sergeant in the United States Army fighting the Germans and eventually captured by them as he stood and fought to preserve freedoms for all. At the very same time, Grandpa Tai was imprisoned by the United States simply for being Japanese, denied all of his core civil liberties by the same government for which Grandpa Bird fought. I concluded my dedication of that book with these words. We work out the theory and practice of assembly between the poles of abuse to which my grandfathers testify. 
we can never take civil liberties for granted, and sometimes the government that guarantees them also abuses them. This is particularly true in a diverse and pluralistic society where different beliefs and commitments lead citizens to different thoughts about what is best for the country, its people, and its communities. I know that this group to which I'm speaking today knows very well the realities of government falling short of honoring commitments to civil liberties, including the suppression of political protests and including even recent calls to challenge the right of your own group to associate over your own values. Negotiating conflicts through politics will, will inevitably produce winners and losers, those elected to public office and those defeated, those who benefit from new policies and those who suffer under them. But no matter who prevails in the political process, a democratic government must protect the groups and spaces where people can continue to pursue and express their alternative visions of what is good. This commitment is not cost free. The right to protest risks disruption, instability, and even political change. The ability to form and maintain groups of people's choosing means some groups will exclude those who don't share their beliefs and values. Tolerating assemblies that do not advance majoritarian understandings of the common good means tolerating expression and practices that we may not like. A commitment to assembly is not without limits, and it is important to restrict assemblies that threaten imminent incitement to lawbreaking or violence. It is crucial to punish evildoers like Paul McKenzie. But those outer constraints still leave a lot of breathing room for difference and dissent. That breathing room will only be secured with broad support for the right of peaceable assembly and the right of association, no matter politics, party, or tribe, as we work to look together to live in spite of our differences. Thank you very much for listening today, and I look forward to your questions. Hello, Deisa. You can do better than that, <laughs> kindly. Okay, I will now hand over the microphone to Fukrudin Hassan uh, for the question. So you give us direction on how to go around that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, my lecturer. And also very much thank you to Professor John Inazu for this enlightening experience as well as lecture. Uh, for, those, for those of us who have questions, I would suggest we make it three. That is from this side, this side, and this side. And kindly be brief and concise. So we can start with this side. Anyone with a question? I think I will represent this side <laughs> for, for the question itself. Uh, Prof, I think you mentioned with regards to unlawful assembly being that which is not allowed by the law and should be prohibited at all costs. So in that context, how then do you critique the judgment of Eliud Gitari vs. NGO Coordination Board that held that the lesbians and gays have the right to associate as provided for under Article 36 of the Constitution, notwithstanding the prohibition of the same under Section 162 of the Penal Code? Uh, thank you very much. for That is from my end. And then we'll go to this side, that side, and then you can cumulatively respond the same. Yes, thank you. This is a very good question. And th this is the key, I think, key anchor of the right to protest and the right to associate is to even advocate for things that are not currently legal, right? This is often how political change happens over time. And so the difference here is you, in, in many countries, you may not engage in a certain activity. So I might be able to advocate for uh, I, wa I want to live into a different way of life, and I want to, you know, in a country that doesn't allow polygamy, for example, I want to have more than one spouse. And it might be illegal, 
but under the right of assembly and the right of association, I should still be able to advocate for it. I can't, I can't commit violence to gain power. I have to go through proper political change, but I should be able to form a group of people who argue together for a different understanding of the law, of what's, what's, what's legal, what's permissible, and that means the possibility of political instability. So it, it's a tension, and this is, I think, the, 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 the inherent trade-off of recognizing any, any civil liberty or any right of association is that you're going to introduce this in, instability to culture because if you are in the majority, if your preferences or if your laws are already enacted, you don't need the civil liberties because the government already protects them. So this is the, this tension that you named is exactly the right one to illustrate what's at stake and also what is the cost. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. I think I took the, much of the time for this, but we'll take the second and the third questions from these two rows. Um, I'm Colin Smiyekum. Uh, my question will be, uh, according to your research, uh, do you think Kenya uh, as a country uh, implements the right uh, to assembly? Um, to give an example, um, last year we had protests. Um, um, I think the opposition leaders in Kenya uh, last year were held in protest in Kenya. But um, to some extent, uh, the protests were not successful in that um, they were intervened by police. Um, so to, according to you, uh, is this right uh, being exercised in Kenya? Yeah, thank you for that question. And you, you have pointed to where on the ground and in a very practical way, this always cashes out how and when and to what extent will the police, or in some cases, I'm told the government services unit, right, will come in and stop a protest from happening. And how, and in my view, the people that we train and the people that we pay to, to protect our society have to be able to give some breathing space to protesters. That means you have to have some risk of instability. Now, that doesn't mean you lay your own life on the line or it doesn't mean you let other people go unprotected. So when you start to see the emergence of violence, then as the law enforcement, as the police, you step in. But the training here really matters. And I, I can't speak to the specifics of the Kenyan context since I don't know the cases deeply. But in the US context, we often have protest, protests and protesters that have not themselves turned violent, but that start to look scary. Maybe there are too many people Maybe they're getting very loud. Maybe they're starting to trespass on some property. And in my view, in those cases, the police should so show some restraints. Now, there is a limit at which police need to shut down protests. But that, that, that line between a peaceful, protected assembly and an unlawful, violent assembly is very hard to know when it, when it, when it switches. And sometimes it can be very dynamic. It can be peaceful and then rowdy and violent and then peaceful again. And it's incumbent upon the police to have very good training and very good judgment on when to intervene. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Wycliffe Kamau. Allow me to first start by thanking you for what a wonderful lecture. And also note that you've done quite some research on the Kenyan context and therefore bring in the concept home. And for that, I appreciate. My question is with regard to the tortious liability of protest organizers. Now, we've stated that in some instances when the protests are beginning, the harm that is potential could not be seen. Sometimes the protests are peaceful and that is what the organizers had intended. However, along the way, it turns to be violent and the same was unforeseen. Now, you also mentioned that the Public Order Act requires that protest organizers notify the police before the protest with the intention of the police granting security. Now that, now that we've uh, established that there are instances where protest organizers will be held to be liable, 
would you suggest that probably the burden to shift from the protest organizers to the police to investigate and identify the people who actually instigate um, harm and the riot who instigate the protest to turn from protest to riot and since they have been notified to grant protection and a riot has actually occurred would it be better for instead of the protest organizers to be held liable for the police to actually investigate and identify the culprits great, thank you great yeah so t two important points there first uh, you mentioned and i want to go back to the notice requirement under the public order act in many cases the most successful protests are the ones that have some pre-coordination with police or local authorities. So in the US context, the most powerful civil rights protests were actually telegraphed and acknowledged beforehand. And this allowed police to be ready for in many cases, thousands and thousands of protesters. It did not diminish the significance of the protests, but it allowed people to at least know what was coming. So sometimes as a practical matter, that can be helpful. What worries me a bit about the Public Order Act is the requirement of notice, because the requirement of notice effectively says you can never have a spontaneous protest. It would not qualify for three days of notice. Now, your other question, which is a very good one, is should the burden shift from the protest organizers to the police to investigate when violence occurs, who the wrongdoer is? And here's the problem, and this is why this potential civil liability is such a, such a concern right now, both in the United States and in Kenya. It doesn't matter who actually caused the harm. It's effectively a negligence standard, pushing actually toward a strict liability standard that will hold the protest organizer liable, even if it, you could prove definitively that that person had nothing to do with the violence. And the legal theory as well, you should have known, right? You engaged, you orchestrated a protest right near a police station and you should have been on notice that violence could have happened. That's an extremely broad standard. And, and your question, which is a good one, is under, under less rigid standards, yes, you might say the police should have to investigate and have some burden of proof to show who actually engaged in the violence. But in this emerging standard, the law, at least in parts of the United States, is going to say it doesn't matter. You can be liable as, as long as any violence happens. There's one here and here, too. Yeah, thank you. Let me give it to him. Are there any specific parameters uh, guiding uh, what amounts to a peaceful assembly and what amounts to a, a riot and an unpeaceful assembly? Yeah, so there are, there are definitely some standards. And, and when you are, if you're actually looking into the way the law works, <laughs> always look for the numerical requirement. That's one of the predicate act requirements. In, in, uh, in Kenya, I believe it's at least three or more, and a dispersal order requires 12 or more. That's also interesting, right? There are two different numerical standards in Kenyan law. One is three, one is 12. In Missouri, it's seven or more. I was actually, and this is a, this is a nice sort of criminal law aside, I was talking with a, an attorney in Missouri who defends protesters and he had, a, he had a client who had been, was, was being prosecuted in federal court for an unlawful assembly. And he was telling me that uh, his client and six other people had been at the protest. And I said, that's, that's just seven and the statute requires seven or more and not seven. And so we went back and actually pulled up the statute on our iPhones <laughs> and I read him the statute and I said, your client is not guilty because there were only six, there were only seven people, not eight. So the numerical requirement is one that affects the difference between a legal assembly and something like a riot. The other standards are much more subjective and malleable. They're the, they're the standards I highlighted earlier. Reasonable fear to a person in the neighborhood, right? Or some, and this is where that, that really strange standard of, of offensive conduct comes into play. If, if the police determine that the protest has gone from peaceful to offensive, in some cases, at least in Kenyan law, they might be able to shut it down. That seems very dangerous as well. So one way to think more broadly about the theory is the more you can push away from subjective standards, the more you can ask police and law enforcement to have higher standards of when to deem a protest unlawful or dangerous, the better you're going to protect the civil liberties of the organizers and the protesters. Thank you. Uh, Prof, it seems like there are other two more questions. 
if you could allow me, and of course extend this hand to the other two questions, because you said three. Are you in favor of that? Two more questions. Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. So, <coughs> good afternoon. Uh, my name is Frederick. I have a question. You actually touched on it a little bit, but I think uh, I would like more clarification. And uh, the question is, what are the common justifications that government used to impose the restrictions on the right of assembly and uh, how ac activists can challenge these restrictions legally, yeah. that is. Yeah, so thank you for the question. So part of it goes to the, the particularities of unlawful assembly. Uh, I don't know if this concept will be familiar, but in attempt law, in, in at least in US criminal law, we look at the target offense. What is the perpetrator attempting to do? And in unlawful assembly, what's weird about the criminal provision is the, the, the potential perpetrator is attempting to do something else that's undefined. The Kenyan penal code talks about engaging in some common purpose. That common purpose might be quite legal, but when that common purpose is illegal or when it is engaged in raucous or disruptive means, then the, the assembly might might turn into unlawful under the law. So how might an activist or a, a protester challenge that? Well, you might do, so for this actually happens quite a bit in, in the US context, be very clear about what the law is and walk right up to the edge of the law. So if the law says, right, you cannot protest within 10 feet of a certain location, be 10 feet in, or 10, 10 yards, 10 meters, <laughs> 10 meters and, and just a little bit away from it and, and, and be close to, to demonstrate that you understand the law but you're pushing up against its limits. Or if the law says you can only protest until 10 p.m., then be very close to that time frame. Uh, the other way I think that, that activists are very effective is to have discipline and be peaceful. This was, the, this was a huge lesson of the U.S. civil rights protests, right? Against extreme violence and abuse of power by the police, the protesters were disciplined and peaceful. And when the rest of the country started to see their commitment to their cause, despite the injustices against them, that started to turn the public opinion. So part of activism can, as, can also be discipline. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Um, thank you, Professor John, for honoring um, us with your lecture and the words of wisdom that um, we've got from you, we appreciate. So my name is Buki. Um, we've met before up there. And my question in re is in regards to the, the significance part of it. Um, will it be safe to say that um, the significance of the right of assembly is um, actually measurable on the size of the gathering vis-a-vis -vis the outcome of the process? Because um, one of the requirements probably within, um, in regards to the relevant authorities when you want to um, go out for the right of assembly is to mention the number of people who are going to be involved so that you might you may get the necessary permit. So, and the effectiveness of the right of assembly is to ensure um, an effective democratic process and political participation and such. So, will it be directly or indirectly um, affected by the size of the gathering of the people? Um, let's say around five people go out for the right of assembly. Will the significance globally be achieved? Um, as to the people who participated or as to the um, effectiveness of the outcome of the process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for the question. So I would say two things. One, the right of assembly is not just about the political process. It is about the political process, but it's also about going outside of the political protest process to protest, right? Or to cause, actually to advocate for a, a slight disruption outside of the political process. Not violence, but disruption. So part of it is, is that. The other piece of it is in terms of the size of the assembly and its effect, yes, for sure, the size of the assembly relative to the local community is going to affect the potential consequences. And what's very interesting here about the British common law antecedents to both the US and Kenyan judicial interpretations is the earliest 
unlawful assembly provisions developed at a time when communications and police responses were quite different. So in the earliest British common law cases, you would have uh, the local police at risk of being overrun by a protest, right? You might have one police officer in a village, and if everybody starts to protest, immediately that police officer is outmanned. So what would happen in the old statutes? Well, the police officer would deputize all of the men in the community who weren't part of the protest. And they said, and under law, you had to respond to the police officer and, and, and squelch the protest, or you yourself could be criminally liable. And that carried over into the early US jurisdictions as well. What's interesting today is think about how different government responds to protests, right? No longer do you have to carry the message by horseback. You just get on the phone and say, bring in the reinforcements now, right? And sometimes the reinforcements can come by helicopter. So the difference, the, the, the capacity of the police and the government to respond to protests faster, more effectively than they used to should also give us, I think, some pause about too much government restriction of protests because it's, it's just much easier to constrain protests uh, relatively quickly compared to what it used to be. Thank you. Okay, let us appreciate the professor, uh, John Inazu. I think you've not done better. Thank, thank you very much, sir. We really appreciate you. Yes, yes, sure. Thank you. Uh, we have been blessed to have uh, Professor Inazu with us, and I think this lecture goes far and beyond our our expectations and as you may recall from our uh, Kenyan perspective Professor John perhaps uh, if I may uh, take you back a little bit to our Kenyan history we've had uh, one of the questions from uh, one of our uh, uh, students asking you in relation to how the process is done in Kenya at some point the man the exit uh, the, 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 the government may not like that part of assembly and protest, so they man the exit in uh, uh, specific uh, residential areas. So they target the residential areas which are likely to have demonstrators. So they man exits. You cannot live when you're more than three or four people at the same time. So that's the kind of um, uh, struggle that Kenya is still undergoing at the moment. And of course, with your insights, these students are, uh, are now empowered to look more into this with greater interest so that we can overturn that kind of response from the government. Allow me now uh, welcome our uh, uh, Dean School of Law uh, to uh, the podium, kindly the Dean. And um, we will have we will have him uh, assist us in uh, gifting our guests uh, who are with us uh, uh, this afternoon. So, Karibu, uh, sir. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, would want to uh, support the recognition of our chief. Uh, speaker, and uh, that um, uh, the knowledge you have shared uh, is uh, uh, very useful for those who are uh, studying constitutional law, and uh, uh, particularly uh, laws relating to liberty. And um, so I think uh, this is an eye-opener. Those who would wish to research deeper uh, would also uh, take uh, the opportunity uh, from your uh, uh, um, from your lecture, to begin to see uh, which areas uh, you know to uh, you know conduct further research. So I think uh, it has been a quite thought-provoking lecture. And uh, again, considering that um, uh, you know the right to uh, liberty uh, basically uh, affects all other rights. So therefore, we we thank you very much and. Uh, we have uh, a token here uh, for you, Professor, uh, to just come to the stage. Okay. 
um, uh, we could clap for Professor Asi. Thank you very much. And uh, we would also want to recognize the role played by Jeff in hosting uh, Professor Inazu <laughs> in Tenwek and also in uh, escorting him to Nairobi. I think this is the first time John is coming to Nairobi. So I think uh, without uh, the uh, assistance of um, Jeff, it would have been difficult to maneuver. So we thank you, Jeff, and uh, we also have a token for you. And apart from uh, uh, Jeff uh, accompanying uh, a professor, uh, the wife of Jeff is also uh, working in uh, uh, Tenwek. Uh, that's an eye clinic, and therefore contributing to the well-good of, uh, of Kenya. So we thank you very much. And uh, last but not least is Sam. Uh, we also would want to recognize Sam, young Sam, Young Sam is on, in, on uh, fifth grade, fifth grade, and uh, he has accompanied his father uh, to uh, uh, Kenya, and uh, specifically to Daystar University, and uh, we thank you for that um, uh, solidarity, and we also have a gift for you here. And uh, you pass our greetings uh, to your schoolmates and tell them that you are at Daystar University. Okay? Very well. Thank you. Um, Ayub? Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dean, School of Law. Kindly appreciate him as he takes his seat. Um, allow me now welcome uh, our HOD, Public Law, Dr. Martin Olo, uh, to grace the occasion. Thank you. Thank you, Ayub, and thank you for a good job done. Thank you, Ayub, and thank you for a good session. And uh, thank you, Fukuruddin and uh, Hanifa, for standing in strong. Uh, you've done a good job, I believe. Yes. John, thank you for coming, and um, Jeff and Samuel. Uh, as you are aware, I was still coming, and I'm glad that I've caught up with you. I was able to follow a bit of uh, your lecture from the YouTube and uh, the dedication to tie the family, your grandparent. And so I followed a bit of that, and I am grateful. Uh, students, how are you? How are you? Good. Are you sure? I was expecting more of you. What happened? Somebody hijacked some of you? And the way you kept on saying we should push off the classes... Uh, we are going to have a conversation after this. What do you think? We must have a conversation. Duswala, we must have a conversation. Yes, I think we are in agreement. Uh, faculty, how are you? Nice to see you. I'm here to give um, a vote of thanks, but also to just echo some of what I've heard. Uh, Fukrudin, your question about illegality and constitutionality. Therein lies the issue ar around the right to assemble.
it's a constitutional right. Yes? But all rights, if not used well, can always result in an infringement. So if I don't exercise my rights, well, I'm likely to affect your rights. But back to your question about illegality and constitutionality, the issue that we need to remember is this. For this country to get freedom, there was what amounted to the colonialists then, illegal activities by Kenyan people. But for Kenyans who were fighting for freedom, they did not care about what was illegal, but they were enforcing their right to self-determination and therefore to independence. So to the colonialists, the, 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 the freedom fighters were terrorists, were infringing the law. They were wrong, and therefore they needed to be detained, they needed to be arrested and arraigned in court. But even as far as that was the law, were they right to fight for their freedoms? So the question then always is that at what point is an issue constitutional and does the outlawing of an issue in itself make it illegal to hold an assembly or to demonstrate? Because how does change happen? Change happens because people, citizens, take issue with a position, even at law or even at the Constitution. And how does the Constitution amendment happen? It happens because we take a position that then collectively pushes us to make a change that we desire. So at the end of it all, the right to assemble is a constitutional right. Then the question that John was exploring with us is at what point does it become illegal? The issue of fear or the issue of infringing other people's rights, as he was saying, becomes a subjective point around which governments want to make interventions. And sometimes they make good interventions and sometimes they make vague interventions. And therein comes our role as lawyers to litigate, to stretch, and to fight. So there is something like public interest litigation. Public interest litigation is always around fighting for what is right or fighting for that that is necessary in order to promote the general good. So I hope that with this lecture, we are better and we can have a conversation. And please take time and read. He sent me two articles this morning. I have not read all of them. I'm still reading. And they were, they were huge. One of them was 51 pages. So I've scanned a little bit of, about it. But again, his writings are available on the various links that he has provided. Please download. And, and, and just look at it. And particularly for some of you who are writing uh, your project papers. Look at how he treats just a subject such as the right to assemble. And he's writing uh, acres of paper or acres of, you know, tons of pages around it. Now you, you have a big title almost with 10 variables inside. And you can't write more than a page. <laughs> so he's just tackling assemble, the right to assemble. At what point is it a constitutional right? At what point is it an illegality? Uh, what is the litigation that is arising around it? So you basically have acres and acres of land around that issue to plow. And so I wish you well as you try and as you purpose. You know, I'm saying you try. Eh? As you purpose to be scholars, as you purpose to be academics, as you've had his journey, he's both a professor of law as well as a professor of religion and political science. And you... Eh? <laughs> and you? We are struggling with you to pass constitutional law. We are struggling with you to appreciate the concepts of thought. 
Well, we are struggling with you to read. <laughs> when we tell you read this article, you, 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 you want to come to us with some wishy-washy statements. You heard him saying that you must always read and interpret the law so that even when you are acting, you act right on the edge of it so that you are not infringing, but you are stretching, you are pushing. And that's what you do. And that's what, you know, the, the, the thing is, as we read about freedom fighters, and he, he's talked to us about civil liberty movement. The reason why the likes of Martin Luther King, the reason why people like Mahatma Gandhi were able to succeed is because they were able to read the law and stretch it. Even where they were out of order, they said they were peaceful. So they kept on saying we are peaceful because then you don't have an invitation to come to you. And of course, you know the difference that in Kenya, as soon as we say there's a demonstration, all the pickpockets and everybody comes. So as you're busy assembling and uh, you know planning what you'll do, they are busy looting shops and they're busy and then the police arrives and it's chaos. So a lot of times our issues drown in these other infiltrations and so on. I don't want to add on to this. Mine was to say, to pass a vote of thanks and to thank John, uh, Jeff, and Samuel Inazu for coming over and for accepting our invitation and for waking up very early in the morning all the way from Tenwek to make it here and to make it in time. So I thank you very much. And for Dean and uh, Ayub who have worked very hard on making sure that this whole um, process has run smoothly. I thank you. I know the DVC was here earlier. So we want to thank the administration for allowing us room to uh, get uh, this uh, public lecture happening. And for the lecturers who have had to cancel their classes in order to allow some of you to disappear. Not to come, to disappear in the thin air. Fukridin, you said in your e communication that there will be a roll call. There will be, I hope there is one. So we are going to look for people. We are going to look for people. Where's Collins? I can't see. Yeah, I was going to look for you because you kept on telling the bus is leaving. So these people, where are they? The ones who are big bus here. We are going to look for them. I'm sure some of them have disappeared into the street. So we're going to look for them. <laughs> but otherwise, thank you so much for coming and for the interest and for the questions. Now you know that this is just a teaser. An academic institution thrives through exchanges such as what John has agreed to do. And academicians never hesitate to, 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 to accept an invitation the way John did to come and share uh, views with others. So you, please learn that you must be generous with your time. You must be generous with your knowledge and share it. But you can only share from that that you have. Okay? You can't share from nothing. So please build up the knowledge and when we ask you to share, please do come and share with us. So I want to thank you so much for coming. Uh, John and uh, Jeff, we are going to have some time and talk. And so we're still around and therefore we'll do that. Uh, so I want to ask that, uh, is the chaplain around? Chaplain's around? Anifa, come, come, come. I'm told you are the student chaplain. There are other chaplains, but you are the chaplain. So... Mm. And we also need you to, to give us a chaplain as well. Uh, let us stand forward of prayer. Let's believe and pray. Everlasting Father, we come before you this good evening. We say thank you, God, for the gift of life. Thank you, Jesus, for the public lecture that you've just had. Thank you for the preparations that you've guided us through till this day. It wouldn't be a success without you, O oh God. And we pray, O oh God, that whoever is here and those who are watching us online, that you may bless each and every soul, O oh God, who participated, dear Jesus. We commit our professor who's just given us 
a wonderful lecture that you may continue blessing the works of his hands, O oh God, that you may continue increasing and enriching his wisdom and knowledge in his studies and academics, dear Jesus. Thank you, O oh God, for the Easter fraternity as a whole. We pray, O oh God, that you may continue blessing us, O oh God, and for the greater opportunities that are on our way, that you may give us a heart, O oh God, to receive and to learn from each and every opportunity that you bring to us, O oh God, that as we are going to depart from here, you will guide us and protect us. And as a school, you continue continue binding us with cords of love that cannot be broken. In Jesus' name we pray, trusting and believing. Amen. Amen. Hey, thank you, uh, Chaplain. That was a good one. So, and now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. Enjoy your weekend and may the Lord bless you. Uh, back to you, Ayub. Yes, we just have to take a few photos here. We'll be taking them here.